Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our passage from Mark's Gospel invites us to hear Christ's invitation to be formed for God. In our passage today from chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, Gospel verse 29, the following Jesus is invited to come and heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He touches her hand, holds her hand, and she's healed, right? And it's so revived that we are told, and we don't quite catch this in the English translation, but there is haste. She immediately begins to serve. Uh, she is broken, healed, and formed to serve. We're often caught up by the narrative, I think, of the healing, the casting out of demon, demons. Indeed, Jesus does, in Mark's Gospel and others, many works of healing, casting out of demons, and these are indeed important. They're important to show Christ's power and his might over against what Mark would call the strong man of this world, the powers of this world, the political, religious, economic, and social powers. Jesus is, we are to see, a, a doer of great deeds. But this, we are told in verse 38, is not the purpose of his coming. Jesus is here, his life and ministry is focused upon the work of preaching the gospel, sharing God's message. Jesus comes to heal us. That is true. Jesus comes to cast out our demons. That is true. But he does these things uh, so that these acts this, that reveal his strength and power may draw us to his teaching and preaching. In other words, we're healed so that those things that block our ears and our eyes to see Christ may be removed and that we may be formed by the gospel message he has to deliver, the good news. He's doing this all along the way, we're told in Mark's gospel to the cross. As one scholar put it, uh, Christ comes to bring us the good news in the midst of our battlefields of life. So what is the good news? The good news is this. God's kingdom is near. We're invited into it to follow Jesus, accepting God's love and grace and mercy delivered to us from the cross of Christ. God's own victorious battlefield of Golgotha. Reminding us that death, suffering, Anxiety and fear and depression, the captivity to drugs and alcohol, the powers of this world, COVID, partisan politics, any kind of suffering, whatever you can think of, these are not going to be victorious in our lives. None of this, none of the burdens that lay us up at night awake, that keep us in our beds, that create fear and in action will have the last word. They will not be victorious. But instead, the message that Christ brings is that He is victorious. We have a faith that follows Jesus and over the centuries knows and proclaims in every generation, no matter what comes, that God is victorious and has a hand at work in the world about us. That victory will not be a victory of our desires for community uh, as orchestrated by the powers of the world, but a victory of God's reign, of God's community. We're called to follow uh, Christ's cruciform ministry, dying to the worldly ways and being reborn in Christ's way of life. We are sent, you and I, to go on God's behalf. We're to endeavor to draw people to a living, loving God who is ever-present in this world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Being a follower of Christ, an apostle, a preacher, a teacher of good news, of 
of salvation and God's love is about engaging one another. This is what Paul kind of helps us to see in that, that lesson from his letter to the Corinthians, isn't it? That this is about engaging one another out in the world uh, on, the, on the sides of our life and the journeys that we make with the people we encounter. This is the pattern of disciples and the gospel is the pattern of the book of Acts. The Pauline letters, all of scripture in fact. How is this different than our worldly vocations? Well, I think Paul in Corinthians really gives us a map for that. Paul offers a vision of this ministry which is so God-centered and so Christ-centered that he cannot be moved, though he may appear to be a part of many different communities. In Paul's letter, it's clear that it's all about God and all about what God is doing through Paul. Paul reminds us that we're not choosing this for ourselves. We're not making ourselves worthy by this work, but instead Christ's love radiating from the cross has made us worthy, has made us part of the chosen family, and its power is making its way through us into the world. You and I, each one of us, are worthy of love, not by what we do, but because we are creatures of God, redeemed by Christ on the cross. And so we're invited to stop hustling for God's love. Because you got it. And to stop making other people hustle for God's love because they have it. Instead, we're invited to open ourselves up to Christ so that God may work through us. That God's power and love and mercy, forgiveness and kindness comes through us into the world, as God did with the first disciples, with Paul, with the first followers in every generation. We are given God's power to do the work into which we are invited to be vessels of grace and mercy. We're invited to share in the life that we live, the God who loves us, and to do so with others. You see, I think Paul helps me understand I'm called to allow Christ to remove the obstacles in my life. Not the obstacles of other people. That's not my job. My job is to allow Christ and His grace to work on me so that I may be healed and formed. My life uh, that, that, that then changes will allow others to find Christ in the world. God heals us. God casts out our demons so that we may serve God. I recently read a poem by Deacon Greg Buffon. In it, he reminded me that the weight we bear in this moment of great trial in our country, among our families and friends, the lament of our lives lost in quarantine, the loneliness, the illness, the financial cost, our expected day-to-day -day disruption, as does us in a manner of speaking. The phone wrote, chaotic emotions, roiling deep waters, anchors unmoored, no ground emerges, no footing secured, I am undone. Yet, as we understand from our gospel, we are healed, Simon's mother so that we may know who we are called to be and to serve God. This revelation dislodges our normative biases and attitudes and allegiances. And again, the phone in his poem writes, what was undone cannot simply be neatly fit back together. Yet, he writes, knowing love, I yearn to be love. There can be no turning back. Here God comes to us and incessantly, ceaselessly, unremittingly, continuously and persistently invites us to follow Christ's cruciform way. So I leave you with the last stanza of the phone's poem. Discerning anew the way, knowing the truth, embracing life, I begin again knit together the broken, humbled, and dependent upon grace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.